It's rare that you'll see Russian and Western media agreeing on anything, but one of the things that they can find common ground on is that the Ukrainian war has taken on a thoroughly international character as time has gone on. While the most important factor has no doubt been the fighting capabilities and spirits of both sides, it's impossible to ignore the international element when it comes to the material, economic and military support for Ukraine that has enabled the Ukrainian armed forces to continue fighting well beyond what their initial financial and material resources would have allowed. When I did my first video on this war, I said that I do not know how it's going to end. And that statement remains as true now as it did then. But what I remain confident in, and what I think the numbers make very clear, is that one of the key determining factors in how this conflict plays out is going to be political willpower in the West. It's going to be how long the Western economies are willing to sustain and at what level they're willing to sustain weapons and economic shipments to Ukraine. So Ukraine's allies matter. The economic support, the military support that they're able to provide really matters. And what I've done here is I've stacked up a list of countries who have sent military aid to Ukraine by their World Bank 2020 GDP figures. And you've got some real heavy hitters on this list. The United States, Germany, the United Kingdom, France, Italy, some of these who have provided very, very significant amounts of financial aid or military aid or both. And of course, on that list, the USA, as it always does, stands out as far and away the largest economy, not just on this list, but also the largest economy in the world by many measures. America isn't the only hero of this story. There are certain things that it lacks. It lacks a land connection to Ukraine to deliver weapons and support to the country. It lacks huge stockpiles of Warsaw Pact era equipment, which is the kind of stuff that Ukraine can use without a training burden, stuff that was produced in the Soviet Union. America throughout the Cold War was busy quite rightfully producing its own military hardware. It also lacks a colossal oversized axe to grind with Russia. America has a long-term rivalry with Russia, one that lasts throughout the entire Cold War, but it lacks the sort of visceral commitment to the Ukrainian conflict some other powers in Europe might have. And it also, of course, lacks a sense of existential threat. While Americans generally have been in majority support of providing support to Ukraine, of stopping the Russians from taking it over, few Americans would go so far as to say the war in Ukraine actually offers any sort of existential threat to the United States, which is the kind of thing that tends to motivate a nation to go from assistance to fanatical support. And so in that context, I'm here to say today that some of those other allies that I listed, despite smaller economic sizes, have really been critical both to how this conflict has played out and also to what happens in the future. In essence, I'm here to say that Poland matters. So what am I going to be covering today? I'm going to be talking through the history of Polish-Russian relations. I'm going to be talking about Poland's strategic situation and the contributions that Poland has made to the current war as one of Ukraine's staunchest advocates and closest allies. Then to sort of bring the point home, I'm going to talk about a counterfactual. I'm going to illustrate how the Ukraine war would have changed had Poland not provided the sort of support that it had. Indeed, if Poland had come down, as some in Russia hoped, on the Russian side. We're also then going to look at what this means for Poland itself. What does this mean for Poland's military, both now and in the long term? What does this mean for the future of the Polish state, depending on the various ways that the Ukraine war might end? And also, why does this all matter? But just as we did with Finland and Sweden, before we jump into the today, I want to start with some history. And because we're now in Eastern Europe as opposed to up north, be prepared for a lot of tragedy and a lot of chapters beginning with the words, and then it got worse. It, it's just the way Slavs do things, okay? And I'm not doing this because of some uh, contention that Warsaw is doing this because it's still really bitter over 1772. And that getting back at Putin by supporting Ukraine is actually some retribution for the Tsar's partition of Poland. What I'm trying to say here is that there is a long history that provides context to everything that happens today. And because we're talking about Europe, that history stretches back centuries. So I'm going to be looking at Poland during the Commonwealth era, what happened with its independence its period under communism, and the post-Soviet era. And perhaps the best place to start is not with Poland in the modern sense, but with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is, at its largest extent, that big red blob that you can see on the map there, which included most of Poland, Belarus, most of Ukraine, most of Lithuania, Latvia, uh, and the territory that was Königsberg that became Kaliningrad. Uh, this was a major power in Europe for centuries with one of its most powerful militaries, a relatively dynamic economy, and a system of rights and privileges that was more certainly not modern, but certainly more extensive than what you would have expected to find either in Russia or in most of Western Europe at the time. 
And just like Sweden, it turns out that being a major power in this neighbourhood almost means inevitably that you end up with a major rivalry with Russia. In 1610, they actually occupy Moscow. This is sort of the high watermark of Poland and Lithuania competing with Russia. Now, eventually they do leave, they go home and their puppets overthrown, but it is something of a high watermark and an achievement that relatively few invaders can claim. Now, unfortunately for Poland, it was kind of trying to do the EU thing before it was cool, in the sense that the Polish parliament and later the individual local assemblies were subject to something called liberum veto, which is basically the idea that any individual member could stand up and veto any particular piece of legislation or major reforms, things like taxation or um, other reforms that you might need to do things like, I don't know, defend the state which made the area really vulnerable to hybrid warfare, something its neighbours, including Russia, quickly picked up. It was a relatively simple thing, for example, to find one noble or one uh, member who, in exchange for a significant bribe or influence from elsewhere, might be convinced to actively sabotage the operation of the Polish-Lithuanian state. Now, that sounds a lot like modern hybrid warfare, so again, history doesn't repeat, but it sure does rhyme. Unanimity proved a relatively unworkable mechanism, and when you combine this with an elective monarchy, which meant that every incoming king basically sold away more of the powers of the executive to the parliament in exchange for the backing of that parliament, you have a hollowing out of the centralisation to the Polish state as time goes on. It's very vulnerable to that sort of sabotage. And the impacts are felt quite quickly. By 1654, something called the Deluge happens. This is only 40 years after the state was strong enough to occupy Moscow. The Deluge is a series of invasions, primarily by Sweden, but also by Russia, that basically devastate and destroy and hollow out the Polish-Lithuanian state. In terms of demographic losses, it's something like a third of the population. Economically, the damage is greater. A number of historians actually contend that during this period, more damage is done demographically, economically, and culturally to the state than was done to Poland during World War II, if that gets you an idea of the magnitude of the destruction that was wrought by the Russians and to an extent by the Swedes. As you might expect, after that sort of damage and devastation, there's a long period of decline for the Polish and Lithuanian Commonwealth. But to the end, it's capable of executing feats of great brilliance. Uh, The famous Battle of Vienna, where the Wing Tussars, which is the cavalry of Poland, some of the finest in the world at the time, who used to wear wings on their backs, um, rode out to Vienna to save Austria. From, Turkish, uh, from a Turkish invasion. That happened after the deluge. With the right king, the right moment, the right motivation, even after the deluge, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had a couple of signs of life in it. By 1772, it was basically all over. Prussia, Russia, uh, and Austria, all of whom had modernized to an extent, had reformed, and had much stronger armies. But by 1772, it's, it's basically all over. Poland is wedged between Prussia, which has become a military power by the late 1700s. Russia has modernized to an extent and greatly built up the strength of its military. And Austria, Habsburg Austria, which you'll remember the Poles saved about a century ago at this point, is a major power. And between 1772 and 1795, these three powers basically shake hands and agree to partition Poland. Again, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Over three partitions, 72, 93, and 95, all of Poland is basically carved up, and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and indeed the idea of a Polish state, ceases to exist for a time. There is a brief revival. Napoleon comes in, kicks everyone around, and he creates a puppet state, the Duchy of Warsaw, and he takes Polish troops into Russia and burns Moscow, partly with Polish troops. But after, as, as we know, Napoleon loses, and the Duchy of Warsaw is dissolved. After that point, Most of Poland's territory, if not its population, is in what's called Congress Poland. Congress Poland is basically the bit of Poland that has done to it what happened to Finland after Russia beat Sweden. Uh, It becomes a part of the Russian Empire, nominally independent as something called the Kingdom of Poland, where again, the King of Poland is the Russian Tsar, but nominally it has its own culture, its own language, its own institutions, and is generally able to govern itself. And again, there's a brief period where that basically works. And then Russia moves towards Russification, and really importantly for Poland, Russia starts to have ambitions of either converting the population or at least suppressing the Catholic right. There are a couple of things that people around the world need to know about Poland, and one of them, and I'm not sure if this is exactly a secret, is 
To this day, Poland's pretty Catholic. And if you think about how Catholic Poland is today, I want you to think about how Catholic Poland was in the freaking 19th century. This did not go down well. And Poland basically developed a reputation for catching on fire every couple of decades as they tried to throw the Russians out because the Russians decided to try and make them Orthodox Russians. So it might not surprise you then that come World War I, Poland's pretty fed up. And as soon as the Russian Empire collapses, just like Finland, Poland nopes right out of there. So Poland gains its independence in 1918 with the nominal support of the Western Allies. Russia decides to come back and invade in 1918. It doesn't take them particularly long. The Soviet Union gets its act together and then it invades Poland with some ambitions, thanks Trotsky, of walking all the way into Germany after Poland and securing the workers' revolution in Central Europe. The Polish-Soviet war is brutal, absolutely brutal in terms of the number of men engaged and the casualty figures but the Poles are able to throw the Soviet Union back. This is where the famous miracle on the Vistula happens, where the Poles manage to break the Soviet codes, like one famous occasion where the Polish jam Poles jam Soviet radio communications by basically going onto the Russians' radio channels and just blasting Bible verses at them repeatedly so the Russians can't talk to each other. In any case, this victory isn't enough to save Ukraine, who Poland is basically trying to support as a non-Soviet state during this conflict, but it is enough to preserve Poland, at least for a while. Now, time for some rhyming history. 1939, the Russians, I mean the Soviets, are back, and this time they've agreed with the Germans to partition the Polish state. So Germany invades, the Soviets invade soon after, and Poland is crushed and partitioned. So ends the Polish state once again. Now, the Soviets established their power in their part of Poland in some pretty brutal ways. There are some major massacres which, of course, they later try and blame on the Germans. World War II then follows. The Germans betray the Soviets and attack the Soviet Union, all the while the Holocaust comes to Poland with its very significant Jewish population, and then the Soviets push back through Poland on their way to Germany. The result is that uh, World War II is an absolute demographic and economic catastrophe for Poland. Many nations suffer very, very badly, but Poland suffers particularly significantly. Its demographic experience is much more akin to the countries of, this, of the Western Soviet Union as opposed to a country like France, for example. And, of course, the Soviets follow this up by installing a red government, a communist government, that rules Poland until 1989. Now, because it's basically a Polish tradition for centuries at this point, there are a number of uprisings, protests, and many acts of resistance in Poland against the red government and the wider Warsaw Pact system uh, over the course of the Cold War. And the moment that uh, the USSR collapses and the risk of tanks rolling across the border disappears, Poland nopes out of communism basically as quickly as it noped out of the Russian Empire. Now, the point of going through all this is basically to say that there is a history of enmity and conflict between the Poles and the Russians, kind of like there is between the Finns and the Russians, or the Japanese and the Russians, or the Turks and the Russians or indeed the, the Russians and the Russians. My, my point is that there are some old memories here, and those memories fade exceptionally slowly. Polish statehood has itself been quashed several times over. The state uh, and its identity has been a target again and again for cultural, religious, or political conversion. And time and time again, one of the parties to that particular process has been Moscow. And so we come to today where Poland, rather than being under the Russian thumb, is now part of the European Union. It's part of NATO. Now, Poland's had, shall we say, complicated relations with the wider EU for the last several years, but it's also critical to the European Union and to NATO because it forms one of the keystone bricks in the sort of eastern wall that protects Central and Western Europe. It borders Russia in two directions, essentially. Uh, Kaliningrad to the north, which is a Russian enclave in what used to be Königsberg, which is stuffed with Russian military units and missile systems. And then to its immediate east and northeast, it's got Lukashenko's Belarus, which is a Russian, very close Russian ally, one would say puppet state, and a nation which allowed Russian troops to enter its territory in order to attack Kyiv in the opening stages of the Russian-Ukrainian war. And then to sit there southeast, it has a long border with Ukraine itself. Poland is, in economic terms as I showed at the start, it's not Germany. It's not a developed Western European economy, but it is one with a strong population and relatively high GDP growth in past years. While it remains to be seen how the current crisis and inflation will affect that economic growth, 
Poland has been generally growing faster than Western Europe for some time now. It's also, and this is important to the current crisis, home to very large numbers of Ukrainian guest workers before the war began and Ukrainian refugees now. So it's a very close demographic, cultural, and linguistic link to Ukraine. And all of this, the, the history and its current geopolitical position, means that Poland's playing for pretty high stakes in the Ukraine crisis. Its economy, its prosperity, all of this is deeply intertwined with how the conflict resolves. A complete Ukrainian defeat, for example, would put Russian forces, and arguably Russian ambitions, on the Polish border in the southeast, probably in the form of some sort of uh, puppeted Ukrainian state under Moscow's dominion. That's something that Poland obviously doesn't want, especially when, believe it or not, you can find clips on Russian TV saying that Poland should be next for denazification in the event that Ukraine is subdued. It's also a nation that faces intense economic implications, political implications, military implications, if the war in Ukraine goes the wrong way. Uh, Poland has economic links and great economic possibilities in Ukraine. Politically, Poland staked a lot on Ukraine uh, as a potential member of the European Union, as a potential friend and ally. This, as well as the obvious military issue of potentially having a buffer state removed and Russian military forces on their border, means that Poland's now playing for very significant stakes. It's uh, fair to say that Poland's got no desire to go back to the Warsaw Pact era, in a nutshell. And having Russian forces on their border with a potential ambition of further influencing their politics or their economy is something that Warsaw isn't particularly willing to play for. And as a result, Poland has gone essentially all in when it comes to providing support to Ukraine during this conflict. And I focus on these stakes because I think they explain a little bit about the scale that we see Poland go to in terms of supporting Ukraine. American support for Ukraine has been strong, make no mistake, but you have to imagine that public support and support among politicians would be just that little bit more frenzied and determined if Russian victory didn't mean Russians ending up in Kyiv so much as Russians ending up in, say, Ottawa, which is basically the equivalent that, uh, to the situation the Poles now find themselves in. So let's have a little bit of a look at the sort of support that Poland has been providing. In scale and scope, it's hard to match to the limited resources that Poland's had available to deploy. The first thing I want to talk about is the support for civilians. Poland has thrown its doors open to Ukrainian refugees literally by the millions. Those figures are very much out of date in the graphic to the right. They, I include them mostly to show the distribution. Of the millions of Ukrainians, overwhelmingly women, children, and the very old, who have fled Ukraine since the start of the war, a strict majority have ended up in Poland. Poland removed all visa requirements and basically threw the border open to anyone who wanted to cross. They've given Ukrainians access to the labor market. They've given them access to humanitarian supports. They've given them housing assistance. In terms of scale, for the, my American listeners, think about it as basically if the entire population of Florida again, an entire new state of Florida, but bolted on to the United States and the entire population was Ukrainian refugees. And when you adjust for, on a per capita basis, you kind of get a sense of the degree that Poland has provided support for refugees so far. Now, this has immense humanitarian significance, but it's also got economic and military significance. Some of the great problems that Ukraine are dealing with right now are things like fuel shortages, energy shortages, difficulties with their economy. And in a situation where you're dealing with very intense logistical bottlenecks, that is, there's a limited amount of transport bandwidth available to get stuff into Ukraine, being able to move these segments of the population into neighboring countries where they can be sustained by those logistical networks, by those houses, by that industry and workforce, this does take a, some pressure off the Ukrainian economy at a critical time. Now, because of the Ukrainian restrictions on men of fighting age leaving, the overwhelming majority of the people leaving have been children who obviously aren't part of the labor force, the very old who aren't part of the labor force, and the women who are supporting the children who would likely have to support the children even if they had been back in Ukraine. So this is immensely important from a humanitarian's perspective. It's an act of great mercy, but it's also important in relieving a little bit of the pressure on Ukraine's domestic economy during this time. And I want to stress again, it is, it's hard to understand just how many people have crossed that border. It's hard to comprehend. Many nations in Europe and North America and elsewhere have had so-called immigration crises, and all of them pale in comparison to the rapidity and the scale of the movement of human beings across the Ukrainian border into Poland and the neighboring states. So Poland's taken in women, children, uh, and refugees, and it's sent back a whole bunch of things that go boom. 
Poland sat on very large Warsaw Pact arms stocks before it went into this war. T-72 tanks and a variety of weapons from the Warsaw Pact era. And it has shoveled them across the Ukrainian border basically as fast as they will go. As of late April, they had provided about 1.6 billion US dollars worth of weapons, which when you compare it to US support is extraordinarily out of proportion with Polish GDP. The United States at that time had provided something like 3 billion in weapons supplies. Poland was at 1.6, but the Polish economy was smaller than 1 20th. It was 600 billion compared to the US 20 trillion. So the Polish effort was really out of all scale. And the other thing to note here is that a lot of these weapons, because they were older, cheaper Warsaw Pact era ones, while they didn't exactly run up the bill in dollar terms, they were weapons that Ukraine needed right at that moment, that they could put into service without training because they were familiar with the systems. So there was a huge amount of bang for the buck there. There were things that America simply couldn't provide because America didn't have large stocks of these weapon systems in hand. Poland did, and Poland was there to provide them at the critical juncture. And there are more on the way. So let's break this down. What are some of the key systems that have gone across the border that have made the difference so far? I'll start with armoured vehicles because everyone loves tanks. Now, as of time of writing, Poland has sent more tanks to Ukraine than Ukraine is visually confirmed to have lost. Now, I'm sure that Ukraine has lost many more tanks than they have visually confirmed on Oryx and other open source platforms. But the fact remains that Poland has been a major supplier of heavy armour to Ukraine. Poland had hundreds of T-72s in reserve at the start of this crisis, mostly this M1R variant, and they have been quick to ship those to Ukraine. Something like a quarter of the overall Polish tank force has gone. Now, yes, these vehicles were slated for decommissioning. Yes, they were in reserve and not in active service anymore. But they were exactly what the Ukrainians needed because they were vehicles that Ukraine was familiar with. We have seen these vehicles and Polish IFEs in Ukraine fitted with, um, in the case of the tanks, that have been fitted with uh, Contact 1 ERA blocks. And we have visually confirmed evidence of them going to action on the Ukrainian battlefield. These are weapon systems that are not just across the border, they've made it all the way to the battlefront. At a time where we know that attrition amongst the Russian armoured forces is very high and that we're seeing different sorts of vehicles come out of Russian reserves, this sort of number, 200 plus T-72s crossing the border from Poland into Ukraine to bolster Ukrainian armoured strength is a very significant contribution. And then we've got small arms. And if you thought this is a section where a guy named Perun is going to shill for the Perun anti-aircraft system, you're absolutely right. Poland was quick to send their domestically manufactured man pads to Ukraine relatively early in the conflict. This is the system that you can see on the bottom there. And in terms of performance characteristics, it's arguably quite superior to a lot of the Stinger missiles that have been sent to Ukraine. Stinger has gotten the fame, um, but a lot of the kills that we have seen, that we have visually confirmed evidence of, tend to be things like Star Streak or Pyrrhon. There are also things like the Kamar, which I put a picture up earlier. In fact, I'll flick back to that momentarily. The Kamar, is the, the, which is the Mosquito, is an RPG system that I'm showing on the bottom there. Now, this thing looks like it was made in a garage. And quite possibly it was. Uh, it's basically a rocket on a stick with a basic folding metal stock. It's about as simple as an anti-tank weapon can get. And during the Cold War, Poland shat these things out like there was no tomorrow. Something like 100,000 of these things were made. And about 25,000 they were still trying to sell as of 2018. I don't know how many they still have in inventory. But it's basically a very, very basic RPG rocket on a stick with a folding metal stock. Now, this thing has disadvantages. It has a very short range. It's inaccurate, and it's probably not going to be effective against a modern Russian tank. But it's also got advantages. You can learn to use it in a couple of minutes. It weighs basically nothing. It'll kill an APC or a BTR or a truck perfectly well. And did I mention the thing where they had 25,000 of them as of 2018? Those are numbers. And at a time when you're trying to find weapons that you can hand to TDF or militia units that have just been raised, who have no experience with any tank weapons, and they just need something right now, the Kamar is a useful weapon system to have, and Poland was willing to provide it. It's also worth noting that Poland has been willing to facilitate, shall we say, or, or allow to take place many private purchases that are being funneled through Poland. A lot of volunteer fighters or TTF guys who are having supplies brought in from overseas or are buying from international sources, those shipments are flowing through Poland. So even where Poland isn't providing the weapons firsthand, um, they're critical logistically in terms of allowing those small arms to make it through. And then let's talk about things that are a little bit bigger. 
artillery and ordnance. Poland's been a key contributor in this category at every stage of the conflict. They were quick to supply ammunition, so ammunition for Warsaw Pact era systems, 125mm shells, 152mm shells. Those things crossed from the Polish border over into Ukraine very, very quickly. And then they expanded that to include air-to-air missiles. They're the only confirmed source for air-to-air missiles that are compatible with Ukraine's jets that we know for sure have been provided to Ukraine. They also opened pretty early with Warsaw Pact era artillery systems, the 2S1, which is a self-propelled artillery system, the GRAD, which is that very famous uh, rocket system, which is where the Soviets decide to strap a pack of rockets to the back of a truck. You know, it worked in World War II with the Katusha, it works as well now, uh, and those went relatively early. But Poland's also been providing some more modern stuff. While America was debating, and Australia and others were debating providing the M777 155mm howitzer system. Poland's gone ahead and provided 18 of the advanced uh, crab howitzers, which I show a picture of there. This is a self-propelled version of an advanced 155mm gun. It's actually an imp- quite an impressive piece of kit. The hull, for example, the, the basic hull is actually a South Korean form that the Poles have repurposed and built into their design. But they've managed to train 100 Ukrainian artillerymen on this vehicle already, and 18 of them are apparently shipped or in service. And they're due to supply 60 more of these things in the next few months. There was a lot of focus put on the M777 because of its range, its accuracy, its lightweight, its mobility. Well, the Crab's got even more range. It's a much more mobile and survivable system because it's self-propelled. It can shoot and scoot. And they're supplying very large numbers of them, 18 already, 60 more on their way. That's comparable to the number of uh, howitzers that America is providing, let alone other actors like, say, Canada or Australia. If you wanted to be really uncharitable, you could compare this to the shipments of uh, Panzerhaubitzen from Germany or the Netherlands. But, you know, we won't go there because I think unpacking German arms deliveries basically requires um, its own entry in MythBusting video because there's very loud voices on both extremes that are probably both wrong. But the point is, Poland has certainly gone above and beyond in terms of providing these artillery systems. And I guess the point I'm trying to get here is not a... Uh, a who's who of every weapon system that Poland has been willing to provide is that there's a unifying theme here, scale and speed. Every country that has supplied weapons to Ukraine has gone through a different cycle of political debate. And then after the political debate and a decision being made, how long does it take for equipment to be delivered to get there? And then once it's delivered, how long does it take to train the Ukrainians on it and get it to the front? Poland is doing all of these things in much shorter timelines than a lot of what other people are able to do. Now, part of that is because it's on its border. Part of that is because it's handing over equipment the Ukrainians are either already trained on or can be readily trained on. But whatever the reason, when you look at certain equipment categories, if you look at confirmed deliveries, Poland has dominated a number of those categories. 85% of known tank shipments to Ukraine, Poland. 40% of known IFEs, 35% of the known self-propelled guns, 100% of the air-to-air missiles, 30% of the MLRS systems. America, a lot has been made about America's recent decision to ship HIMARS to Ukraine. As far as I can see, only four HIMARS systems have already been confirmed as pre-positioned in Europe um, and ready to go to Ukraine. Poland's already provided 20 Grad rocket systems at least, um, and will be making every effort to provide more as time goes on. Okay, so it's me. So you knew I was going to talk about economics and logistics, but really, it's one of the key reasons beyond weapons shipments that Poland really has been critical. Despite the sinking of the Moskva and a lot of talk about anti-ship missiles, the fact remains the Russian Black Sea Fleet is entirely capable of maintaining a standoff blockade of Odessa. That is, at the moment, if anything comes out or goes into Ukraine, it's not going out or coming in by boat. It's taking the train or it's being driven on the back of a truck. And that means the rail connections. And Ukraine had a very well-developed rail system before this conflict, and still does, capable of carrying very, very large volumes. That rail system is more important than ever before. So you start looking at the rail connections into Ukraine and start thinking, okay, if I'm trying to get Western military support or Western economic and humanitarian support in, what route is it going to take? Well, you might think you go via Romania into Moldova and across the border from Moldova into Ukraine. But the problem there is, and it's not marked on this map, Along that Moldovan border, there's an area that's packed full of Russian and pro-Russian troops. It's called Transnistria. It's essentially an unrecognized state that people were wondering whether or not Russia plans to link up there and possibly cause problems in Moldova in the event they're eventually able to take Nikolaev or Odessa. So 
You have to imagine that Russian troops doing a train inspection on something coming through might see a bunch of Polish tanks on the back of the train put two and two together and go, maybe, maybe we're going to turn this one around uh, and not give this one permission to transit. Just, just, just maybe. And then you look at the other borders and you go, OK, Hungary has a very, very narrow border. Romania, likewise, has a couple of connections. Poland stands out. And it stands out for more reasons than this map initially suggests. Not only are the major lines for Ukraine linking into Poland, there's also the matter of the railway gauge. Ukraine, as a sort of post-Soviet legacy, still overwhelmingly uses the Russian gauge of railway. That's the width, that's the width of the, the railway track. You can't drive from different gauges uh, one to the other using standard locomotives. Poland is home to a lot of the infrastructure and some of the few lines that allow trains that are on the Ukrainian gauge to transition over and transload on onto the European gauge. This transloading infrastructure is present in a number of places on the Polish-Ukrainian border, and I've included um, a shot from Google Maps where if you squint hard enough on a big enough screen, you can actually physically see. And the northeast of that uh, screenshot is Ukraine. In the southwest of that screenshot is Poland, separated by a waterway. And you can make out the large transloading and railway yards and the railway lines linking those two together. Polish uh, railway links are critical and there's frenzied work going on in Ukraine and Poland at the moment to expand the capabilities and carrying capacity of these railways and of these transloading stations because Ukraine would very much like more to be able to get in and the rest of Europe and the world desperate for say Ukrainian grain is desperate for every ton possible to make it out which is why so much work is happening. As painful as it is right now, for all those countries that depend on, for example, Ukrainian grain. One of the primary export routes, and it's not perfect, but one of the few things that they've got going for them at the moment, is a railway link that takes it out of Western Ukraine, ships into Poland, then north by rail through Poland, all the way up to Gdansk, where it's put on shipping transports in the Baltic Sea and transported from there. There are other routes, but that gives you an example of the sort of lifelines that Ukraine has available to it. Without this railway infrastructure, without these transloading stations, without the fact that Poland has basically allowed NATO to set up shop in its territory and turn entire air bases, train stations, and entire tracts of land into basically warehouses and coordination points that collect all of the weapon systems and humanitarian aid going into Ukraine and then organize their shipment across the border. Without all of that, the, the lifeline that is supporting the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian economy just wouldn't be able to sustain itself. And it probably doesn't surprise you that Moscow hasn't exactly reacted warmly to Warsaw turning itself into the Amazon Prime of weapons deliveries to Ukraine. Russia was quick to shut the gas off in Poland. All deliveries were halted in April. And you have to think that's a step that would be out of the question in terms of Russian relations with, say, Germany or many of the nations of Central or Western Europe. And it's gone beyond that. Russian diplomatic and economic efforts to pressure Poland have been extensive basically since day one and have only grown over time. And while no one likes to take Kadyrov or many of the people on Russian state TV seriously, when they do talk about what's next or expanding the war in a universe in which they win, the country that they tend to name as next in line for denazification, well, it, it's Poland. And I want to put this into perspective here. When you look at the pain threshold of the various allies that Ukraine has in this conflict and where their red lines for support seem to be and what's ready to dissuade them, some countries draw the line at too much inflation in energy prices or food prices uh, as a line on how far they're willing to go for support for Ukraine. Others blanch at the idea of having their fossil fuel supplies cut, at least in the near term. Poland's basically said, do your worst. And that's the stance that they've taken. They're willing to take the energy embargo. They're willing to take just about any economic retaliation the Russians throw at them. And the only response has been more artillery, more shells, more aid, and a more open home for Ukrainian refugees. So why does all this matter? That's the question. Why have I decided to do a whole video on Poland when most coverage of the war in Western media barely mentions the country? My first point is that without Poland, Ukrainian resistance as we understand it, the war as we understand it now, a relatively slow grinding fight of attrition in the east of Ukraine after the defeat of the thrusts on uh, Kyiv, and the pushback in Kharkiv, none of that's really possible without Polish cooperation. Western weapons deliveries have been important. They've been critical. 
And those deliveries are very difficult without Polish airspace, Polish rail infrastructure. Polish intelligence is another area that isn't discussed enough. And there's also the important question here of political influence. Russian strategy now appears to be attritional, a slow grinding fight. And in that sort of slow grinding fight, the only way Russia wins in the long term, economically and militarily, I've talked about this before, is if the will of the Western power supporting Ukraine falters. Because at the end of the day, if the political will is there, the economic and military resources of the West are far, far greater. So the only thing that allows Russia to win a war of attrition, to leverage its much stronger starting position, the fact that Russia began with a much stronger military than Ukraine, despite its problems, the only thing that gets them to a winning position from there in a long, drawn-out fight of attrition is if Western political will falters or Ukrainian political will falters. So in terms of determining Will Western attitudes falter? Will the West drop the ball on Ukraine? Will it decide the cost is too high? It depends how many voices are in the tent and what they're saying. Poland's in the tent, and Poland's basically screaming, go to Moscow. Okay, not that, not that extreme. If there were no nukes, they'd be screaming, go to Moscow. Instead, they're going to be the ones in the room screaming, back to the 2014 line, or indeed, they'd probably back Zelensky if he said, throw them out of all of the Donbass. The Poles are going to be one of the most persistent voices in favour of supporting Ukraine, of standing up for Ukraine, of supplying more weapons, more equipment, and because they're in the tent of NATO, because they're in the tent of the European Union, and because they're so critical to the Eastern strategies of both those bodies, they're going to have a voice, they're going to have some influence. At the end of the day, Washington is going to do what Washington does. London is going to do what London does. Berlin is going to do what Berlin does. But the Poles are a strong and persistent voice in favour of continuing this fight into the long term. And in the end, it doesn't really matter for the purpose of European politics whether the Polish attitude on that point is based on cultural kinship with the Ukrainian people, a desire to protect Poland's own security, or just because this is a fantastic chance to punch the Russians in the teeth. And are you really a Polish government if you deny yourself a chance to punch Russia in the teeth? In the end, that doesn't matter. What's going to matter is Polish advocacy and Poland's voice in terms of determining ongoing European and American policy towards this conflict. And the easy way to, I suppose, illustrate this in a somewhat ridiculous way is to flip the entire example on its head. What does the conflict look like in Russian dreamland? And what I mean by this is that over the years, there have been some interesting ideas come out of Russia in terms of Ukraine's fate. Many of them have involved the potential partitioning of the state. Now, allegedly, and this is only allegedly, some years ago, the Kremlin did put out soft feelers uh, to Warsaw to basically determine whether, you know, Warsaw would be interested in some sort of partition of the Ukrainian state. Now, that didn't go very well and didn't receive a very warm reception, allegedly. But as silly as it seems, the idea is worth reflecting on. Uh, Europe is a place where many countries still have very old clashing territorial claims. But... And this seems very obvious to say. The nations of Europe in general have agreed that peaceful cooperation, friendship, economic development, all of these things are far more important than trying to adjust or relitigate questions of border disputes. They're more important than revanchism. So whereas Russia is all about revanchism, about denying the right of the Ukrainian state to exist, describing it as an artificial state and trying to relitigate the questions of border and identity, Poles aren't willing to stab Ukraine in the back for Lviv. They're not. And I'm sure there are some in Moscow who subscribe to very realpolitik, almost 19th century views of the world in terms of territorial claims and revanchism and empire. I'm not sure they're going to be able to really understand that. But to us, it's obvious. But consider for a moment, if it wasn't obvious, a Poland that was supportive of Russia a Poland that had taken a pole, a pro-Moscow stance, even a Poland which had declared non-intervention in this crisis, would have turned all of NATO's efforts, all of Europe's efforts, to support and sustain Kyiv on its head. So basically, uh, Poland's decision not to basically do Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact 2.0, as ridiculous as that idea seems, that concept does allow us to illustrate just how critical Poland's role has been in this entire thing that Ukraine's survival, Ukraine's ability to fight, basically hinges on Warsaw's decision to take its current path. And that path is also going to have very significant implications for the Polish state going forward. 
The first point to think about is what this means for Poland's military capability, because the war in Ukraine has touched off a very rapid spate of announcements on the modernization of the Polish army. Poland had large stocks of legacy equipment, Warsaw Pact era equipment. Most of that's going to Ukraine, and a lot of it is going to be backfilled with modern Western equipment. Tanks from Britain, tanks from Germany, tanks from America. And at the same time as this new equipment is being uh, brought into backfill, the financial barriers against modernization are being removed. In some cases, it's because equipment is being provided to support the backfill. In other cases, it's because the Polish government is approving additional funds. But you also have to imagine that in terms of NATO military aid and European military aid, Poland is going to be a priority in the near future because of the importance of sustaining Poland as a military flank against an ongoing unstable war zone. We're going to expect more NATO troops, and we have seen more NATO troops move into Polish territory. With that basing comes security assistance. With that basing comes additional funding assistance. So Poland's military potential is evolving very, very rapidly as a result. They're going to operate Patriot. They're going to operate F-35. They're going to operate M1A2 set V3 tanks. And they're going to operate HIMARS. And not four HIMARS systems, not six HIMARS systems. Poland's talking about ordering 500 HIMARS systems. And if they had them yesterday, they'd probably get lost by the Ukrainian border. And this has very real implications for the balance of conventional military power going forward. Uh, we talked in the video on Sweden and Finland about what adding those nations' militaries to NATO potentially means in terms of the limited war scenarios between Russia and NATO. Because as I've said before, total war scenarios usually end up in nuclear fireballs, so it's not really doesn't really make that much sense either to start one or to waste too much time and sanity talking about them. Poland's modernization puts a more capable, motivated force on NATO's eastern flank. They will have all of these advanced weapon systems. And Poland joins Finland and Sweden in terms of being the nations that are closely positioned and capable of intervening quickly in a lot of those limited war scenarios. Poland, for example, would be there very, very quickly in the event that an invasion went in against the Baltic. In an attempt by Russia to establish a land bridge to Kaliningrad, you have to imagine that Poland would be there basically at the forefront. And this modernization of Polish military capabilities makes it less and less likely that a Russian military, especially a Russian military that has been heavily depleted by the Ukrainian conflict, is able to conduct that sort of operation. And because they know they can't conduct that sort of operation, they're less tempted to try. So this is a major improvement in NATO's ability to dissuade limited actions by the Russians. And it also improves uh, Poland's, I suppose, voice at the table, their influence on matters of European defence. Because while they won't be European leaders in every area, I don't think the Polish Navy is going to win any prizes relative to, say, the French Navy anytime soon. They're still going to have amongst Europe's largest tank and IFE fleets, and they're going to be a valuable component of NATO strategy going forward, which is going to give Warsaw influence that far outstrips its economic power. So what does this mean in terms of wider post-war possibilities for Poland? Because as I said, the stakes are pretty high. A victorious Ukraine, that is a Ukraine that is able to generally resist the Russian invasion, that is able to, say, push the territorial boundaries back to pre-February 2022, that is able to eventually become a European candidate, a EU candidate, and finally a full EU member. Well, what does that mean for Poland? It means Poland gains an allied state with a battle-tested army to the east. So Poland is no longer worried about Russian forces pushing against on that part of its border. Instead, it's got a solid ally that's in the same tent that it can train with, that it can mutually support, it can rely on in the event of future Russian advanced uh, ambitions. It's also got another allied voice in the EU. Poland doesn't exactly see eye to eye with many of the, the Western and Central European nations of the EU. That's, that's just a matter of record. While there are huge... Uh, huge common values and common ambitions and commitments to the European project, there are at the same time also political, legal, cultural differences. Ukraine adds a nation which is more closely aligned with Poland, perhaps, than some of the other existing EU members, and this gives uh, Poland a great additional voice and ally in the European tent. There's also an economic opportunity here, potentially a very large uh, economic opportunity. Once the war is over, Ukraine has to be rebuilt. And presuming that EU or American or international funds 
forthcoming for some sort of martial or rebuilding plan for Ukraine. You have to imagine that's going to create a whole raft of uh, possibilities for Poland, for Polish construction workers and construction companies, for the Polish logistical network, for Polish workers and companies because they will be supporting the, the logistical supply chains and supporting the efforts in a devastated Ukraine to bring it back up to speed. And as Ukraine regenerates, well, there are opportunities for the very closely interlinked Polish economy. And the economic potential, of course, goes beyond that. It goes to what happens if trade comes across the Caspian Sea into Odessa and then through Poland and into Europe. The possibilities are endless. At the same time, Poland in this scenario gains a, a weakened Russia. A Russia that is less able to threaten it, to influence its politics, to intimidate it. A Russia that is in a diminished position to provide a security threat. And, and to go further, to go to the most extreme example, uh, what is a Russian defeat, an unambiguous Russian defeat? Not that I'm saying that's going to be the result, but in the event there's an unambiguous Russian defeat, what does that mean for Lukashenko and Belarus? Now, if you play the UNO reverse card and Ukraine solidly loses the war, and Russia is able to strip all of the eastern territories away into what is basically their idea of Novorossiya, if Kyiv either becomes a technically neutral or a Russian-dominated state, all of those benefits basically get turned on their head. There is no reconstruction economic boom. There is a Ukraine that is being pushed into the Russian sphere. There is a great and enlarged Russian or Russian proxy military threat to the east. All of these advantages get flipped entirely on their head. So Poland's activism and commitment to the conflict makes sense through the lens of their strategy, their culture, their economic interests. They're playing for very significant possibilities that go far beyond the change that this would mean for, say, Spain or Italy or Portugal, European states that are supportive of Ukraine for political reasons but don't have quite as much on the line as their Polish friends and colleagues do. So, in summary, Ukraine certainly benefits from its wide array of supporting allies. Every dollar helps, every bullet helps, every shell helps. But nations have different levels of interest and capability. They have different dedications to the cause and different capacity to assist. Poland has both. Poland has the determination, the fanaticism of the Baltic states, with a much deeper reserve of weapons um, and equipment that it's capable of providing. So while American and British aid sort of dominates the Anglophone media, I don't think we can forget Poland. It's the reason I made this video. Poland's vid uh, role has been absolutely critical. They are the reason that Kyiv has been able to fight as hard as it has, as long as it has. And as far as the Poles are concerned, they're playing for keeps. The immense humanitarian effort sheltering millions of Ukrainians could be the basis of goodwill and an alliance that serves Poland incredibly well for the next half century or more that tightly binds Poland and Ukraine, that revolutionises their relationship and allows them to become allies in the European tent going forward. Or it could become a costly, failed investment, all depending on how the Ukrainian war plays out. Although I'll say that whatever happens, you have to imagine that for the millions of Ukrainians who have found shelter in Poland where they thought they had nowhere else to go, if nothing else lasts beyond the boundaries of this conflict, I think Ukrainians will remember this. All right, so let's do a channel update before we close this one out. Firstly, a huge thanks. There's been really, really good responses to the last few videos, particularly the last one on corruption. The return to the longer form content appears to have been well received. Now, not every video, not every topic is going to merit the full 50 minutes, um, but I've certainly taken the message home that where it is appropriate, I'm going to speak to time rather than trying to cut myself down to 20 or 30 minutes for the sake of popularity. I do have a number of upcoming videos under consideration. I'm looking at the infantry problem, which is the uh, question of mobilization and manpower on both sides of the conflict, and also looking at something there that I don't think has been dwelled on enough, which is the role of DPR, LPR proxies, so the Donetsk and Luhansk uh, forces in supporting the Russian invasion. There's a lot to be examined there in terms of the role those forces are playing and how they help explain the dichotomy of casualty figures that we're seeing for the Russian side and the experiences the Russians are having. I'm also looking at doing a myth-busting and propaganda video. That's been on the cards for a while, but it's just difficult to shape it up. The problem is there's an awful lot of myths out there. It takes a lot less time to generate a lie than it does to thoroughly rebut it. So what I'm really looking for is some guidance as to what myths are the most pernicious, the most common, that really deserve to have some time dedicated to them. 
Like, I could focus on the really out there ones, like the idea that 20,000 NATO Special Forces soldiers have been killed in Ukraine so far. That's, that's a legit myth that did the rounds. But it's also a very niche one. So I'm interested in insight from people into ideas that you think deserve analysis in that myth-busting video. I'll also note that I have been asked for a 100-day update, uh, basically a check-in on how the conflict going. I'm reluctant to do that, if only because there is so much uncertainty over how it's all going. And I'm not sure I want to step into that zone. But if there's significant encouragement for it, then I can do an update on things like the economic condition or mobilization or manpower limitations on both sides. But in terms of analyzing the battlefield, I don't think the information out there is good enough. And I don't think I have the capability to tell you how the battlefield is evolving. In any case, again, I did want to put forward my genuine thanks for the immense support that I have received. It has made all the difference. I've had a huge influx of people sending me email content, commenting, engaging. I'm thankful for all of it. So please um, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you again shortly.